now we, we're going to go somewhere else, spinopelvic uh, dissociation, uh, the ortho side, because, you, you know, we have the spine side and the ortho side. Usually this is done in conjunction with a spine surgeon. Uh, this is the best option. I would like first to acknowledge Professor Dr. Mohammed Abu Saud, Professor Dr. Osama Faru, and uh, Professor Mark Riley from New Jersey, USA, because I learned a lot from them regarding this aspect. This is a case, a male, uh, 34 years old. You can see his uh, pelvic fracture. You see the, the sacrum on this side, the sacrum on that side, crossing here. And you can see the transverse processes fractures, which means that probably what we see now on CT is after everything recoiled back in place. So this is not what happened during the accident because these cannot fracture while the pelvis looks like this. So there, there should have been some massive vertical displacement which recoiled back in place, okay? So I hope by the end of this lecture, you will learn the definition of spinopelvic dissociation, the classifications and to describe spinopelvic fixation. Mm -hmm. Spinopelvic dissociation by definition means that the lumbar spine with the superior central part of the sacrum is completely separated from the lower part of the sacrum and the pelvis. So this is the, the essential part. Usually it presents like uh, an H or a U. So usually a vaccaro H or U. This completely separates the pelvis from the spine and thus we have a functional separation between pelvis and spine. Usually it occurs in very high energy trauma uh, resulting from axial loading in airborne sports like parachuting and stuff like this, falling from heights, suicide, jumpers, fracture, and vehicle accidents. And what happens is that the spine is in, into the pelvis and the two femoral heads push the pelvis up. So the pelvis goes up, spine goes down, and pelvis flexes. So the notable axial loading will result in flexion of the pelvis over the lumbar spine. And when we speak about spinopelvic dissociation, this means bilateral. Because we have a unilateral one that is much more simple. Some of the books will call spinopelvic dissociation looking at only bilateral injuries that completely separate the spine from the pelvis. Because the unilateral cases are much easier and we operate them more frequently than this time. Of course, there is a very high incidence of neurological uh, complications in this type. Classifications, you all know we have Dennis, Vaccaro, A.O. Spine, Eiler, and Roy Kami. The Dennis, here we're speaking about transverse zone three injuries mainly. Vaccaro, we're speaking about the H and U. Uh, the lambda, you can, you can say that it's gonna be probably a unilateral one. So the pelvis is not gonna be completely separated from the spine. Then there was this A.O. Spine, uh, knowledge forum that published this uh, some time ago, type A, B, and C, which were the spinopelvic injuries. But however, the newer classification of the AO, which was published in the compendium in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma 2018, they spoke about the undisplaced H and U as 54 type C0. So they called it C0 because it's undisplaced. Type 1 is a displaced unilateral. Uh, type C2 is a displaced bilateral, and type C3 is a U or H that is completely displaced. So the AO calls it now 54C3. Euler classification also is important for us. It's one of the landmarks I look at if I want to decide if I'm going to do a spinopelvic fixation or triangular osteosynthesis or not. It speaks about type A, which are lateral to the facet joint, so with a stable lumbosacral junction. And then these ones cross the superior end plate of the sacrum, and, but they do not cross the facet, but they have a variable degree of spinopelvic instability. And then type C, of course, which involves the facet, laminae and pedicles of L5S1, and this has a clear spinopelvic dissociation and should be fixed using a triangular osteosynthesis or spinopelvic fixation. So this is the most critical type, the Euler type C. Roy Kami, it was modified by Strange and Vonsen and Lebec. And uh, this type is only angulation with no separation. This one is angulation and separation. This one is complete translation. And this type, type four, which was added lately by Strange Vongsen, which is a compression of one of the vertebrae. So what are the challenges in this spinopelvic dissociation? 
Number one, the challenges are the high incidence of neurological complications, starting from root problems till lumbosacral plexus traction injuries. So you have a wide spectrum of neurological injury, higher incidence of failure. I'll show you, this is one of my cases in 2017. He lost his money in the, in the revolution, so he jumped from the seventh floor. We fixed them only with uh, iliosacral screws, and of course, he failed. Uh, they failed. And by the way, they failed while the patient was non-weight bearing because he had an associated calcaneus bilateral fracture femur, so he was bedridden when he failed. So he failed in about five months while he was lying in bed. So you can imagine the muscle forces and the push-pull forces on the hemipelvis. So we need to fix anterior and we need to do the spinopelvic fixation. The spinopelvic fixation is indicated, as we said, in either B or C, type C3, significant vertical instability like the ones you've seen, bilateral transforaminal or common uted transforaminal, delayed presentation, geriatric fragility fractures, and associate, associated lumbosacral dislocation. So these are the indications. But when we say spinopelvic fixation, what do we mean by spinopelvic fixation? This is a systematic review published 2021 in the Journal of the American Academy, and they describe the spinopelvic dissociation as having three types of fixation, either iliosacral screws alone, triangular fixation, or combined spinopelvic fixation. So they consider the three of these as spinopelvic fixation. Okay, but the ones we are speaking about now are the spinopelvic dissociation that have a complete separation between the pelvis and the spine. So iliosacral screws will not be enough. Uh, th what we talked about here can be useful for unilateral cases, but for bilateral cases, it's gonna be always a spinopelvic fixation. This is a book called Pelvic Fractures published by Springer in 2023. And they stated in their chapter that bilateral injuries of the posterior pelvic ring, at least the axial spine on one side, must be connected to the sacroiliac fixator to achieve good mechanical stability. So this is how we do it. Uh, we do the triangular fixation. It combines usually a lumbopelvic fixation from L4 or L5 pedicle to the ipsilateral ilium and a transverse fracture fixation, whether using iliosacral screws or more commonly in our department now, we use the transiliac internal fixator and I'll show you what is this. It's just a rod and two pedicle screws in the pelvis. Triangular osteocentis, this was, this was published in 2003 and 2006. And these were meant for unilateral cases. So when we say triangular osteocentis, we mean triangular osteocentis for one side. But the cases we're speaking about are always bilateral. And we need to, f to pull the pelvis because as, as I told you, the, the axial spine is driven down into the pelvis and the pelvis is driven up, so you need to pull this. And even Mark Riley showed us this technique that he uses. He puts them actually on the on the traction table and then he extends the traction table so that the whole body pulls the spine uh, upwards while the traction table pulls the both lower limbs uh, downwards. We can fix here with an iliosacral screw. We put our pedicle screw, we reduce and then put the rods, okay? And this is where we put our, uh, our iliac screw. It can be done from the posterior superior iliac spine or an anatomic entry point even from the sacrum, whatever point, you, you like to do, you do it. We insert then the connecting rods. We use the tran transilial internal fixator as a substitute for iliosacral screws. So in some cases like this that require iliosacral screws but are highly commutated, we relied on the idea of macward pivot point that says that if two screws cross in front of this red point, they will give stability to the pelvis, even anteriorly. And that's what we do. We do just two spine screws and rods. You can do one level, two levels, whatever you want. I like to do two planes because it prevents uh, rotation of the hemipelvis in many directions. And we published even myself and a group of my friends, uh, Said Asim, Mahmoud Abdelkarim, Ahmed Gouda, and Mahmoud Fahmi. We published actually two um, papers in 2023 speaking about how safe it is and how easy it is. We do not try to compare it to any other modality mechanically, but we said that even in patients who have sacral dysmorphism, the transiliac internal fixator has nothing to do with the sacral dysmorphism. 
And that's why I'll show you this technique, which is published by uh, Muhammad Abu Saud in our department. Saeed Adib, he's a spine surgeon that, uh, that was uh, taught by Dr. Yusri. Muhammad Samir Gubba and Fuad Zamel, they published this new technique where they use the transiliac internal fixator together with uh, spinopelvic fixation. And this is, this is their case. Actually, the case I started with was a case by Dr. Muhammad Abu Saud. You can see the pelvis, and you can see that this is a bilateral transforaminal sacral fracture, Dennis 3, Vaccaro H, type C3, and on the right side, it's Euler 3. And when you look at the lateral view, it's a Roy Kami type 3. So by default, this is a spinopelvic dissociation that requires bilateral spinopelvic fixation. You can see here that it's all Dennis 3 because it's crossing the central sacral canal and Roy Kami type 3. This is what they did. They put the spine screws in the ilium. They reduced the pelvis, put the rod, and then they reduced the, they put the pedicular screws and then reduced the spine to the pelvis and fix the rods, okay? And this is the post-operative AP, and this is to just to add stability because we have, when we have a vertical component, sometimes after we put the transiliac internal fixator, we find that the lower part of the vertical component is a bit open. So we sometimes add a, a small direct fixation plate, okay? So that's what, what was done. And of course, we turn the patient and fix anterior because if you do not fix anterior, expect failure of your construct. You have to fix anterior. And this is proven. And there are many cases that failed because they lacked anterior fixation. This is the inlet view of the patient. You can see the reduction. This is the post-operative CT. Of course, this part, we cannot do anything about it. We do not control the anterior part of the sacrum at all. We, we do not go there. This is the uh, coronal. This is the post-CT. And this is the 3D reconstruction, okay? This is the final result of the patient. So my take home message is uh, spinal pelvic dissociation is a functional separation between the pelvis and the spine with a high incidence of neurology. Classifications, you know now, Dennis Vaccaro, Euler, Roy Camille, and the AO. Lumbopelvic fixation is indicated in these cases of lumbosacral instability, spinal pelvic dissociation, and highly unstable bilateral sacral fracture. Modes of fixation include iliosacral screws, triangular osteosynthesis, or combined spinopelvic fixation. And remember to fix anterior to increase stability. But uh, one comment only if we have diastasis in the symphysis pubis and spinopelvic dissociation, we'll go anterior first. We'll reduce the symphysis pubis and we'll put two plates, then we'll go posterior. This is what we actually do. I agree because when you uh, when you fix anterior, it actually helps in the reduction posterior. So um, and that's why we always use the iliosacral screws because they are easier. You you reduce anterior with a pelvic reduction clamp, put your iliosacral screws and fix the plates. So you you reduce and fix simultaneously. The problem with anything that you do prone is that if you want to do something anterior, you have as you said to do it first. But sometimes in some cases like this case. When the diastasis is, is not that much, sometimes when you, when you reduce posterior also, it helps in the diastasis. And then you can turn the patient and fix it anterior. Yes, I, thank you. Excellent overview uh, of this pathology. It's difficult pathology. We do, uh, we have a lot of uh, patients. Um, Paul Tonera is my partner, you know, uh, was supposed to be jump on this call as well. Um, what do you do for the, the sacrum, which is rotated? Um, uh, you know, most, all these, uh, you know, sacral uh, is rotated forward. You know, what, you know, how, how, how do you fix those? What do you mean rotated forward? Like, yeah, so the sacral fracture can be. Yeah, the, the, usually this is the most difficult part to reduce, but usually when we do the traction, mm -hmm. we don't have this traction table, this fancy traction table that Mark Riley uses. But what we do is an AO femoral distractor. Sometimes I use just the pelvic uh, reduction clamp, the young bluth. I put a screw in the ilium, a screw in the lower part of the sacrum, and I distract. And then you can reduce. Very rarely, in one of the cases, it was sort of impacted because the, the, the guy was like 18 years old, for, so he had like a plastic deformation. I had to put a, a, a cob elevator and lever on it. 
Otherwise, it, it was extremely difficult to reduce. So sometimes you put a carbon lever on it, but this is very uh, dangerous. Usually we do also the decompression during the same procedure, but I removed it because of the time restraint of the lecture. I didn't want to go into... What do you mean by details. decompression? Lam lam laminectomy with sacrum? Sacrum yeah, laminectomy? Yeah, because, because it's open and we're in there. So by the way, we decompress yeah. the nerves. So we do these, case, we do these MIS, all of them. Yeah. So we do, so Paul Tonetta will pull the pelvis first. We yeah. put the sacral sc uh, screw first, uh, SI screw first. And then we do either one delta frame or both sides, yes. depending on the, the injury. We do, we we take two uh, lumbar fixations, not one. You know, the you know I saw in the slides in the yeah. AO now they they have one. I you know I advise strongly to get two point of fixations, L4 and L5, and the iliac. Right, so we do that. Um, because of the uh, you know we're able to do those MIS when when we have the sacral is these the this S1 in probably sometimes S1 plus part of S2 rotated yeah. forward. There's one way to do it. You can put a, you know, a screw or tab in S1 and r rotate it first. And then uh, you put the pin, at, you know, SI screw. Before you put the screw, you put the, just the drill bit. And I rotate it over the drill bit. And after I, rot I derotate it over the drill with the percutaneous, my percutaneous you know, tab or screw yeah. of in S1 percutaneously. After I derotated, then Paul Tonetta compressed the uh, the the, the uh, iliac uh, screws. So, okay, but you do it actually minimally invasive. You mean a small all opening? Just not small, like or the percutaneous. Percutaneous. Because there all are two techniques uh, all, published: all per, all the one percutaneous. percutaneous and the other mini invasive one, where we just retract the muscles and no, so no, no, you no. leave the muscles intact, but you you all do your fixation from a small incision on one side. For this kyphotic sacrum, actually, in many cases, we faced that we couldn't correct this kyphosis or the translation in the sacrum, and we rely, as Sharif said, just to decompression and the vexing, and the most of the patients are happy and satisfied. But and even... No, but you're no concern. <laughs> 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 no, just, uh, yeah. Yeah. No need. Yeah, but in some cases it doesn't.